Welcome everyone to Influenza, an event hosted this evening by Great Lakes St. Lawrence Kairos, one of the five regional networks that operate across Canada, uniting ordinary Canadians working together on ecological justice and on human rights issues. Uh, the silver lining of Zoom is that it gives our community events breadth that we never had in the past. So we're honored tonight to have uh, guests from across Canada, from BC to Prince Edward Island to the Northwest Territories. And we even have a guest from south of the border this evening. Welcome everyone. Acknowledging traditional Indigenous territories is one way to recognize contemporary and historical Indigenous presence and land rights. It's a small step towards dismantling the continued impacts of uh, colonialism and undoing Indigenous erasure in our everyday lives. So tonight, we express thanks that we are able to work and live in these territories. We're thankful to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time immemorial and who continue to contribute to the strength of our communities. A few words about tonight's agenda. We have a rich lineup of speakers who have graciously accepted to share their wisdom with us. Uh, we will first hear from Vicki Monag, followed by the, uh, uh, the two uh, speakers from um, Kairos Guelph, who are going to introduce the video that they created. And, um, and then we will also hear from uh, Randy Halusa Delay. So we ask that you hold all your questions until after all of the speakers have presented. You can, if you like, put your questions in the chat box as the uh, speakers uh, are presenting and we'll get to them. We have about a 15 to 20 minute window after the speakers have gone through to uh, take your questions. And we're going to uh, close the uh, event this evening with comments from Yusra Shafi, a young woman who is going to COP27. So um, I hope that you will have a chance to stay for uh, the entire event. We hope to be done by 8.30 if all goes well. And a special thanks also to uh, Sh uh, Shannon Neufeld at Kairos, who is our technical uh, person this evening. So she's going to be recording in and out as the evening progresses. Uh, but only the speakers will be um, recorded. So my name is Elaine Garreau. I am the co-chair of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Kairos with Sherilyn Sprackman. And I would now like to introduce Sherilyn Sprackman to uh, make an opening reflection. Yes, good evening, everyone. Evening here in Ontario, and welcome to everyone. It's wonderful to have people from across the country and one person from south of the border, as Elena said. As we gather tonight, us people of faith, I open with this devotion, a reading excerpted from the Book of Hope by Jane Goodall and Douglas Abrams. It reads as, my message of hope is this. You realize that we can win these wars, that there is hope for our future, for the health of our planet, our societies, and our children. Please believe that against all odds, we can win out because if you don't believe that, you will lose hope. Sink into apathy and despair and do nothing. There is great hope for the future in the actions, the determination and energy of young people around the world. And we can all do our best to encourage and support them as they stand up against climate change and social and environmental injustice. 
Finally, remember that we have been gifted not only with a clever brain and well-developed capacity for love and compassion, but also with an indomitable spirit. We all have this fighting spirit. It's no good denying that there are problems. There's no shame if you think about the harm we've inflicted on the world. But if you concentrate on doing the things you can do and doing them well, it will make all the difference. As we lead forward, thank you. Thanks, Sherilyn, for that. Our focus tonight is on ecological justice, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Vicki Monag. Vicki is a Bodwe Wadami Ojibwe Anishinaabe Kwe from Bosale First Nation. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Vicki, and uh, welcome to those that are joining us uh, now. The recording has started again. Um, I would uh, now like to introduce uh, Elizabeth Snell and John Lawson from Kairos Guelph, um, the creators of the thoughtful video that we're about to watch this evening. Uh, Elizabeth Snell is an ecologist who ran a small ecological uh, consulting business with her husband. This allowed them each to work part time with their uh, and spend some time at home at the same time with their three children and be active in several environmental and social justice groups. Her work involves studying habitats in southern Ontario. Uh, which she conducted for government, uh, for conservation authorities and environmental NGOs. She's been a member of Kairos Guelph and its 10 day predecessors for 33 years. And she has attended Dublin Street United Church in Guelph, sometimes sporadically uh, for 71 years. John Lawson is a retired United Church uh, of Canada minister. John has served um, United Churches in a number of communities in Southern Ontario and most recently in the city of Guelph where he resides with his partner. John has always loved the outdoors um, and is an avid gardener, camper and hiker. Out of that love of the outdoors comes a deep concern and a desire to protect our beautiful world and its creatures. The climate crisis both haunts him as well as pushes him to be part of the healing of creation. Elizabeth and John, welcome. I guess I start and thank you very much, Elaine. And hello, it's great to be here with so many interested participants. Um, I've followed climate science for years and become increasingly alarmed by the, the facts and the projections and the, especially the inaction. Um, but I'm also encouraged by the opportunities if we act now. I guess it's the seventh fire that Vicki referred to. I I've, I've very briefly share these aspects of the climate crisis using the metaphor of a curable disease, touching on the cause and the symptoms and the prognoses and the treatment. My hope is that viewers will view the understanding of, will improve their understanding of the extreme urgency for action and of the opening it offers to transition to a much healthier, fairer society. We're, we're at a Kairos time, really a critical, extraordinary moment for government, business, and citizens to work together to build a better world. The video evolved from the faithful climate conversations um, by For the Love of Creation. We made it about a year ago, so some of the data may be a bit dated, if any, but if anything, the uh, urgency has grown, but so has the progress. So now renewable energy is clearly the cheapest form, and uh, maybe another example could be Europe accelerating action to renewables after the loss of Russian gas. I have a list of the data sources I used if any, anyone's interested. I also want to add a note um, on the influenza treatment that 100% renewable, however, however essential, 
is not enough. And as again, as Vicky pointed out, accessing the necessary minerals alone for the, and this is for the 100% renewable, would bring enormous damage. So we also have to question limitless growth. Human resource use is already twice what Earth can sustain. And the rich poor gap is gapes wider every year. Um, the world recently, the World Wildlife Fund uh, reported that Earth lost almost 70% of its wildlife populations since 1970. Huh. 70% since, since I was in university. Um, so more rich country resource growth, growth will break down Earth's ecosystem and destroy hope for global justice. But I really feel that faith communities like Kairos can inspire the transition. We can be promoting living abundantly and much more simply, stressing interconnectedness with nature as Vicky so eloquently ex explained, uh, a stronger sense of community and sharing like tools and cars and shorter work hours, healing planet, um, stronger public services, income redistribution, gender equity, just general liberation from a consumerism treadmill. And we could also facilitate conversations of the kind of economy we want and the right indicators for it. So it really adds up to less stuff, lower carbon emissions, more fun, and more justice and more peace. All for the love of creation. Um, so I'll hand the virtual mic over to, to John, I guess, for his introductory comments. Just a few introductory comments. Vicki has uh, said it so well, um, saying that um, our worldview is a problem as well. So we have, uh, and Liz, I think, lays out um, the story of the scientific story really, really well in the, in the video. Uh, and I think it's important to get that science right. Um, um, it's interesting that in our conversation, sometimes people don't get that right, or they really don't have fully appreciate it. So that part of the video we think is really important, but equally important is what Vicky said, that our world moves to change. Uh, and it means that we need to, especially settler culture needs to look in the mirror. And as Christians, we need to look in the mirror and say, what has been our part in this worldview where we have bought into uh, 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 a system where we believe that endless growth is possible and where we're separated, as Vicky has said, from the rest of creation, somehow we're above it. So to look not only at our own personal uh, histories uh, as a culture, a settler culture, but also to look in the mirror about our faith traditions. Are there ways in which it has in fact been part of the problem? And we framed this all in terms of uh, an illness uh, that we need to get over and we need to be healed from. And so uh, uh, I lay out th uh, three of those, um, the, disease, the disease of dominion, uh, the disease of colonialism and imperialism, and the disease of despair uh, as three ones that we could look at. You could choose others, there's, there's many others, but it seemed like a, a, a way of beginning the conversation. And we hope that that will be able to be part of this evening where we hear uh, your ideas and thoughts on this as well. And so I guess, I think it's time to see the video, I guess. Thanks so much for being here, by the way. Uh, it's a real honor to be with you tonight. Thank you, John. Thank you, Elizabeth. Shannon is now going to share the video. It's about 22 minutes long. The influenza pandemic is flashing cold red for humanity. Successful treatment requires understanding this climate emergency, this everything emergency, this spiritual crisis, this disease. The victims? Humans. Other species. Canada. The world. Today, tomorrow, you? The disease is the burning of fossil fuel, 
coal, oil, and gas, emitting carbon dioxide and other gases. Currently, Asia and United States emit the most. Though much of China's emissions are from making products for North America and Europe. But emissions accumulate and total area under the graph indicates influenza origins. Europe, including the EU and United States, have burnt the most fossil fuel over time. The main symptom is worsening fever. The rising global average temperature trend matches the carbon dioxide trend. We're already three quarters of the way to the 1.5 degree rise threshold beyond which the disease becomes devastating. That's why 1.5 degrees is the Paris Agreement target. The complex global climate inflicts a wide range of fever locally. The Arctic is suffering the highest rise from normal. Other red and yellow areas are also enduring more heat than usual. Few land areas are asymptomatic white. Fever disrupts the whole climate metabolism, already unleashing cascading effects. Severe flooding, parching droughts, terrifying wildfires which accelerate the pandemic by emitting extra carbon, arctic melting which also worsens the fever since dark water absorbs more sunlight and heat than reflective white ice does, ocean rise disrupting communities, and the spread of serious diseases. How does influenza cause fever and disruption? Natural levels of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases trap some of the sun's heat, making Earth a Goldilocks planet. Not too hot, not too cold, just right for life. All life evolved to fit the range between 150 and 300 parts per million carbon dioxide that existed for hundreds of thousands of years. But the Industrial Revolution's burning of fossil fuels, the remains of plants and animals from millions of years ago, has sent concentrations of carbon dioxide skyrocketing far beyond natural levels. Who is burning the extra fuel? The world's richest people. On average, a Canadian or American emits far more than an Indian or Chinese person. The richest 10% of the global community, which includes most Canadians, causes half of the emissions. Our climate action can make a real difference. If we continue riding this influenza wave, what is the prognosis? With no policies, the pink graph, humanity is doomed. With Glasgow pledges, we are around the yellow line, still distressingly over the 1.5 degree threshold. For our pandemic wave to avoid the worst effects, we must start bold, effective treatment now, the turquoise line. What would the main prognoses look like? Today's policies lead to widespread human misery, decimated biodiversity, choking air pollution, brutal storms and heat, hunger, disease, crashing stock markets, mass migrations, and death. The turquoise line to make massive transformations to slash emissions, rapidly phase out fossil fuels, overhaul agriculture and reforest extensively could bring fresh air, green cities with streets blooming with urban agriculture, high speed trains instead of cars and planes, 50% tree cover, 
more affordable, comfortable, convenient lives, stable, good jobs, a global south leapfrogging to renewable energy and appropriate development, stronger, healthier communities, huge health cost savings paying for much of the transformation, decreased tensions and increased collaboration. Project Drawdown experts estimate the global effort to reach net zero to emissions produced, balanced by those removed by plants, could save over $74 trillion by 2050. What an opportunity for our generation, for Canada to lead, leveraging our ingenuity, experience and resources. We have the solutions. The key is speed, implementation immediately and flat out. Delays multiply treatment urgency, intensity and cost and risk failure. If we'd started in 2000, we could have followed the gentlest blue curve for relatively mild treatment. Now to stay within 1.5 degrees, we must follow the steep gray line of stronger measures using investment, pricing and tough regulations. Waiting longer will overwhelm any recovery ability and risk Canada being left far behind. The immediate treatment? Phase out oil sands starting immediately, ensuring support for workers. Canada must keep 83% of our fossil fuel reserves in the ground for any hope of the 1.5 degree limit. Push very hard on energy conservation. Focus sharply on renewable energy, upgrading the electrical grid and electrifying our machines. Invest liberally in protecting nature. Greatly expand assistance to the global south, the main and largely innocent victims of the influenza pandemic and to whom we owe an immense ecological debt. And because we delayed so long, we must invest in adaptation, infrastructure improvements to deal with built-in impacts, as BC has learned. The short-term prognosis with this bold treatment the International Energy Agency predicts these prescribed immediate treatments will lead to a fairer, healthier 2030 global community. Britain has already accomplished a percentage reduction comparable to Canada's 2030 target of 40 to 45 percent below 2005 emissions. 60 percent reduction would be even better. With reforestation in Kerala, India's poorest state, forest already covers over half its area. Real action is doable. While we need to move much faster, momentum is building. Whole towns in Alberta are going solar. Quebec is switching from diesel to electric buses. Calgary's LRT is powered by wind. By 2030, BC will require 90% of all new car sales to be electric. By 2030, Canada's clean energy sector jobs, already 430,500, will grow by 50%. Alberta will see the most clean energy job growth of any province. And by 2030, it's predicted the nation's electric vehicle industry will employ 184,000 people. 80% of the cars sold in Norway are already electric. Households can act while also urging society-wide treatment. Less beef, fewer flights, and switching to an electric car and home heat pump 
would together have the average Ontario and footprint. Join an advocacy group. Contact your government representatives. Most importantly, spread the vision of the positive prognosis if we all act. Our generation has this unique opportunity to not only avert disaster, but to build a better world. We come now to the second part of our presentation. Influenza isn't just a science issue requiring strategies to reduce the burning of fossil fuels. It is also a spiritual issue. Our very relationship with nature and the environment also needs to be healed. Pope Francis in his papal letter, Laudato Si, on the climate emergency, draws on the voice of St. Francis of Assisi, who saw all of life as connected. St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister. This sister now cries out because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters, entitled to plunder her at will. Notice the violence against the feminine, against Mother Earth. Let's take a look now at a few of those imperiled relationships and some ideas for healing. First, we name the disease of dominion. Many environmentalists have pointed out that the Christian creation story gives humans license to exploit. The Bible says, let them have dominion, that is human beings, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over all the creatures. This Genesis story has been interpreted as setting a hierarchy with God separate and outside of creation, and humans at the top of the pyramid of life. Creation then simply becomes a bunch of natural resources to be exploited. Nature is seen as a machine for us to manipulate rather than an interconnected web of life to be honored. Sadly, many Christians see this earth as fallen and that our true home is not here at all, but in heaven, and that caring for our planet is of a minor concern. To counter the disease of dominion, we have the vision and the prayer of Jesus that they may be one. It is a prayer for the healing of relationships, human as well as non-human, because we are part of a web of relationships. If we view God not only as above creation, but also in and through all creation, the whole world is sacred. It is a part of the very body of God. This is the view of many native-based spiritualities, and we need to humbly learn from them. We come now to the disease of colonialism and imperialism. Canadians this summer were brought face to face with the terrible truth of the Indian residential school system that took Indigenous children against their will with the purpose of killing the Indian in them. Nothing short of cultural genocide. The discovery of unmarked mass graves of hundreds of these children brought us face to face with the violence of our colonial past. Colonial exploitation of people and resources from all around the planet has sadly gone hand in hand with Christianity. Our fuel burning continues to victimize 
our poorest global neighbors and indigenous peoples everywhere. We are called away from the disease of colonialism to a healing journey towards right relationships. At the center of it is the call that we will love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That means listening to all our relations, being in relationship not only with two-legged but also four-legged and multi-legged creatures, as our Indigenous brothers and sisters teach us. It means hearing and responding to those neighbours, especially in the Global South, who are most affected by the climate emergency. It means divesting from exploitation and instead investing in healing community. It means embracing the wisdom of other religious traditions. And finally, it means recognizing that we are all one on this precious yet fragile planet. Finally, we look at the disease of despair. It's an understandable response to the overwhelming emergency which we're facing with the climate crisis. But the writer George Monbiot challenges this. He writes, catastrophe afflicts people now and unlike those in the rich world who can still afford to wallow in despair, they are forced to respond in practical ways. Despair is not an option. Our inaction has forced them into action as they respond to terrifying circumstances caused primarily by the rich world's consumption. The Christians are right, he writes. Despair is a sin. The healing journey from despair towards a living hope can take many forms. The parables of Jesus reminding us of a small amount of yeast leavening a whole loaf or a small mustard seed that grows all speaks about the irrepressible life force found in all creation, including in us. We need to find practices that ground ourselves and find healing actions that bring hope and joy. Gardening, a walk in nature, playing with kids, finding expression in art and music, joining others in the climate, in climate healing, for example, planting trees, writing letters, working in a community garden. Find others who share our concerns and together find ways to respond. Keep inspired by stories of hope and action from people around the world. Good things are happening. Find out and join in in your own unique way. We invite you to consider pausing the video for a moment and consider what we have presented, both from the science as well as from the faith perspective, the spirituality perspective. Rachel Carson, who began the modern environmental mu uh, movement, said this, those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. And so we ask you now, where does your faith or spirituality guide and inspire you as we confront the climate crisis? In 2018, a young teenager named Greta Thunberg, who felt the illness of Mother Earth and the crisis of the climate acutely, sat down outside the Swedish parliament to protest the inaction of governments and leaders. That simple act sent ripples of action around the world. You never know where one simple act of protest and healing will lead. 
we can send out ripples as well, and we don't know where they will lead. We can begin with conversations where we share from the heart and listen to others and their concerns. We can begin to act at home by buying less, eating less meat, or finding ways not to use and abuse fossil fuels. We can invest in a healthy future by supporting local businesses, buying organic, or divesting from companies with a poor environmental record. And finally, we can advocate by urging governments at all levels to act, sharing that we care and have a vision of a healthier future for all on this planet Earth. The message we have is a simple one, that we all must begin. We all must act in big and small ways, and we need to do that now. Just below this video in the notes on YouTube, you will find links to further information and ways to act. Also, please add your own notes and comments in the section there and share what you have done to bring healing and hope to this beautiful and wonderful planet. But most important, the message we have is that we need to begin. We all need to begin and act and act now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and John. That was uh, a thought provoking video that you put together. And yes, uh, Elizabeth, as you mentioned, some things uh, are evolving. I mean, it, things are moving at a fast pace. And that brings us to our next speaker. Uh, Randy Halusa DeLay is the Ecological uh, Justice Program Coordinator at Kairos. Uh, he moved to Toronto last year from Alberta. Before working at Kairos, he was a university professor focused on environmental justice in Canada and interfaith uh, religious climate activism. Uh, and before that, he was a wilderness guide. Uh, now he navigates the urban wilderness in Toronto on his bicycle. Welcome, Randy. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was a wilderness guide until the knees started hurting too bad. Then I became a university prof until other things happened. And I started working for Kairos, and it's been great. Um, let me share my screen here, and I'll get started. So the thing that I was asked to do was to talk about my experience at um, uh, a COP. I went to COP 22. And I'm assuming that you can see my slide right there. Yes? Okay, so yeah, COP22 was in 2016 in Marrakesh, Morocco. And it was the year after the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, which was kind of a groundbreaking thing, although it hasn't necessarily manifested all that well. But what the countries of the world agreed to in Paris was that we want to try to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius as a global average and you know, definitely under 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's currently about 1.1 or 1.2 degrees of warming. Um, so the COP22 is kind of special because the signatories of the Paris Agreement agreed really fast to do it, uh, surprisingly fast. And so COP22 became a COP that was about trying to raise the ambition and you know do what the countries had agreed to do. So I want to explain today a little bit about the nuts and bolts about how a COP works since COP27 is coming up. And I'll even explain what COP means in a, in a second, but also reflect a little bit on the following question, which is what do faith groups and religious activism bring to the climate meetings other than the potential mobilization of religious publics, which I think is actually really important. It's one of the reasons that I'm involved with Kairos 
But, um, you know, do they bring anything else other than just getting a, another sector of the population interested and active? So this is one of the most important pictures and, and a picture that I constantly portray. And this is taking place during an ecumenical Christian service at one of the relatively few Christian churches in Marrakesh. And these are all members of the Lutheran World Federation delegation. Um, and LWF had decided that year to bring only youth and primarily youth from Africa to an African cop in Morocco. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, do religions bring something that isn't what environmental groups, governments, corporations, and so forth are bringing? I'm not even going to begin to argue that climate change really increases the vulnerability and exposure of people around the world. And it doesn't matter whether that's in Senegal or in Vancouver, uh, and it, but it, definitely that doesn't happen equally because Senegal has fewer resources. Senegal is also affected to a greater degree by climate change and just can't adapt as much. Uh, so Canada and other developed countries need to do much more work to contribute their fair share to the adaptation, but also the work still that remains at mitigating climate change emissions. At COP22, we often hear that you know, fossil fuels are essential for developing countries to be able to you know, get to a decent standard of living. Well, the 47 LDCs or least developed countries, they committed in 2016 to going 100% renewable energy. I don't exactly know what has happened since. It'd be really worthwhile to track that. The point is they said, you know, we want to leapfrog a system that we know isn't sustainable and that you know we won't be able to work with for a long time. Why should we invest all that money, resources, effort, and so forth? Let's go straight to renewable energies. So any of the discourses about fossil fuels, I think are dramatically undermined. Um, why are religious groups involved? Well, many religious groups do humanitarian and development work and climate change is eradicating decades of international development work. The Canadian Coalition on Climate Change and Development includes groups like um, World Vision Canada, Mennonite Central Committee, Canadian Food Grains Bank, United Church Oxfam, and others. There's lots of other reasons that religious groups are, are involved as, as well, including um, you know, just thinking through their moral vision about how should we live in the creator's world? How should we engage with the rest of creation? Things like that. Um, but also a real concern about climate justice. And I'm going to talk more about that shortly. So what is COP? What is the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, was set up in 1992 at the Rio Summit of National Leaders. All 190 plus countries of the world signed on, and therefore they are party to the agreement. So COP stands for the Congregation of the Parties. And for 22 years at that point in 2016, uh, they had met annually. Now other meetings happen on a regional basis. There's also a midterm COP that happens every year in Bonn. But COP 22 was because it had been 22 years of meetings um, since the UNFCCC was set up. Now we're up to COP 27, now, there was a pandemic skip year in 2020, so it hasn't been exactly 27 years, but it's been 27 meetings. Now, the agreements under the various congregations of the parties include the Kyoto Protocol, 1997, uh, the Paris Agreement in 2015, and others, lots of other ones that you probably haven't heard about. And, and the COPs include lots of non-state actors, so not just governments, but also civil society, women's groups, uh, land reform organizations, environmental organizations, business groups, and so forth. Every COP lasts about two years, and you try to rotate among the, the, the continents. Uh, the next one will be held in 2023 in uh, the United Arab Emirates, and then after that, 2024, it will be in Australia. I attended as a delegate with the World Council of Churches, which is also affiliated with the ACT Alliance, or which used to stand for um, the Action of Christians Together. 
Uh, and it's kind of like um, religious groups, uh, mostly Christian groups, development organizations, and so forth. Now, the Catholic groups under SIDC meet separately. They're not part of the ACT Alliance. Um, I also was given permission by Citizens for Public Justice and Development and Peace, which is the Catholic Bishops of Canada's uh, Development and Justice Organization, to kind of say I was part of them. Um, and because of that, I was able to participate with Climate Action Network Canada, which is our national network of organizations interested in climate change sort of stuff uh, and is affiliated with Climate Action Network International. There were, I was officially badged for all levels of access, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I went to you know two sets of meetings today because ACT Alliance met at eight in the morning to kind of plan the day, who's going to go to what and so forth. And Climate Action Network International met at about three o'clock, which is sort of the end of the day, not exactly, but uh, as a debrief of the day and a reporting back of the different things that people went to, whether that was side events, which are sponsored by all kinds of different organizations and governments, or whether that was actual negotiations associated with, you know, climate finance or, um, you know, what the uh, Alliance of Small Island States really wanted to see happen or the very large group meetings and so forth like that. The rest of my day was kind of spent wandering. Uh, I actually went as a researcher, um, but I was also trying to be useful. I was trying to engage with politicians and so forth like that. I was there for the first of the two weeks. That's all the time I could get away from my teaching. Um, the first of the two weeks is a little bit less attended. The second week, heads of state start heading there, the major uh, ministers of environment and, and so forth. You could say the big weeks go in the second week. So here's some pictures associated with COP22 in Marrakesh. And you can see a whole set of very large tents in the background at the edge of the city. Uh, I was lucky that my where I was staying was relatively cheap and um, was within walking distance. It was only about a 40 minute walk to the, to the site. There are three zones at a COP meeting. The blue zone is the most rigorous and then there's the green zone and then the public zone. So in the blue zone, you'd, you'd come in to, through the gates, you'd have to show your badge and swipe in and so forth like that. And then there's this large promenade where it's the, you know, a shelter from the sun. And then those large tents. And here's a picture of the inside of the tent um, with one of the World Council of Churches delegates. Um, and these are where the major plenary sessions were held. And then other things that would happen would be press conferences, or like I said, side events, which are kind of like conference presentations. Um, or the uh, woman on the left is associated with Climate Action International, and, and she's handing out a daily eco bulletin, which was kind of a summary of the previous day and what had happened, what might have been negotiated, or what kind of interesting things happened. And Climate Action International gives out the Fossil of the Day Award, which Canada won a whole lot of times for a whole lot of years. Um, because we we're such a uh, fossil fuel producer and really got in the way of actual climate negotiations from you know, sometime in the mid 2000s until sometime around 2017 or so. The green zone was a less rigorous place to get in. It's kind of the site of civil society and business organizations. And this is a photograph taken from the entrance of the blue zone across the street, behind the bus, and there's the green zone there. And in the green zone, like I said, there are civil society organizations presenting what they might be trying to do or what they might be trying to advocate for. So in Morocco, there was a lot of agrarian cooperatives, women's organizations, and things like that. Um, but there's also uh, corporations. So you can see promotion of electric vehicles and, and so forth. And then there's the public zone. And the public zone didn't require any kind of badging at all to get into. Uh, it was a place where um, real considerable advocacy, you know, protest movements or, uh, you know, any kind of attention getting kind of stuff happened. So indigenous groups from uh, South America were here or, uh, you know, on the Tuesday of the first week, the U.S. had had a presidential election, and so on the Wednesday, uh, we all found out in the morning that, you know, who had gotten elected, 
And it was a very interesting, just a crashing of emotions for a couple of days with Donald Trump being elected and going like, holy moly, what's going on here now with our world? Until again, a very interesting phenomenon. China stepped up and said, we're going to try to fill that void of, you know, global climate leadership. Um, corporations started to say, you know what, the United States is only a portion of the world economy. So we're still going to have to go for it because we have to deal with the EU and the rest of the world. Um, but, you know, the one picture is a, a picture of a, an activist saying, okay, here's what the presidential to-do list is. And that's taking place in the public zone. If you remember back in 2015 or even to Glasgow last year, you remember the large climate marches that might have happened and those started in the public zone and then would walk through the streets. The structure of a COP is highly procedural, highly technical. The list of acronyms is beyond comprehension. Um, there's a two week schedule, as I've mentioned, that includes thematic days, you know, there's gender day, youth day, civil society day, science day, water day, and so forth. Um, the Sunday before things start on the Monday were kind of initial strategy meetings. So people from around the world gathered with Climate Action Network International and tried to figure out what is what are we going to do? How are we going to really work hard um, at COP22 in 2016? It was to raise the ambition to really move us towards only holding the changing climate to 1.5 degrees Celsius. I mean, we're, we're, we've over, we're probably gonna overshoot that anyway um, because the national commitments uh, really are probably gonna only limit um, overall global warming to around 2.7 or three degrees. So we still have a long ways to go. But um, those strategy meetings are really important. Uh, Saturday, was a global day of action. Sunday was a day off and Saturday night there was a NGO party, which was a lot of fun to just meet with people and just be able to relax. What did the delegates do? Well, why are they there? Well, one thing is there's a lot of meeting and planning together. And so this is a set of pictures that show like, you know, day one, there's only a few people there at the World Council of Churches ACT Alliance booth. And then a few days later, there's a few more people. By the end of the week, when I had to leave, there was more people and it got busier and busier and busier as it went. But that meeting and planning together can be really important. I mean, we can do a lot through Zoom, we can do a lot through email, but we, it's also another thing to really talk to people and really kind of, you know, spend time with them um, and, and work out strategy and so forth together. Second thing that delegates do is a lot of uh, engaging and lobbying, engaging with uh, politicians, ministers, bureaucrats, and so forth. And here's just some examples of the thematic working groups that the ACT Alliance had and the organizations that kind of led those working groups. So you can see Christian Aid UK organizing the campaigning and mobilization thematic working group and Christian Aid Philippines, along with the Russian group, organizing the thematic group on women and climate. Uh, there's efforts to communicate back home. We produced one minute video clips just shot with a cell phone. This is Lydia from Kenya uh, in the Anglican church saying, this is why I'm here. This is what's important. And those were used to communicate not just back to Kenya, not just to Anglicans, but by the World Council of Churches put on their website and, and try to communicate. It. And we tried to, to amplify the voices of our brothers and sisters from around the planet. Fourthly, making pronouncements or delivering statements such as the Islamic Climate Change Declaration, which uh, was um, released during uh, COP22 in, in Morocco. Or, and again, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to build solidarity. I mean, we as Christians believe that we're part of a global body of Christ. Uh, is, is the church broadly speaking, a social movement. Now, that was one of my major research areas as a social scientist to look at social movements and, and how they produce or provoke or try to, to generate change. Um, but that sense of solidarity also extends across faith faiths. Um, in the bottom picture, that's a woman from Mali who is Muslim, who is brought by the Lutheran World Federation to COP and is in a side event communicating what's going on in, in Mali. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, five of the members of the Lutheran World Federation, including 
the tall fellow in the back with the longer head <laughs> in the center. Um, Pascal from Senegal was 28 years old, and he was the head of the um, Lutheran Church of Senegal. Because they had said, look, we need to start listening to youth, especially around something that's affecting our country so, so significantly. He also told me that it was quite challenging because in Senegal, um, it's really elders who have, who are perceived as having the wisdom. And so him as, as a youth trying to you know, lead the church um, as the, not, not the paid executive director kind of staff, but as the, um, the, the president uh, for the year. Um, it was a very interesting phenomenon to have somebody so young leading the denomination there. Um, and a sixth thing that happens at COP and what delegates do and what not just the delegates, but all of us who are paying attention can do is to be a public witness. So on the left, the fast for the climate is something that happens on the first of every month. There are people all around the world and it started with Yeb Sanyo from the Philippines in 2013 when um, Typhoon Yolanda, um, in Canada, we call it something different. I always get it wrong, Hyen, I think. Uh, it blasted through and killed 8,000 people right during the COP meetings of that year. And so he began a, a fast for the, for the meetings and then it has carried on as a climate fast every month. Or there are staged actions during COP. And we uh, did this action about getting finance out of fossil fuels, which is still an issue. The Royal Bank of Canada, for example, is one of the largest funders of fossil fuel extraction and production in Canada. So if you bank with the Royal Bank, your money is helping continue fossil fuel, fossil fuel emissions and, and climate change. And then other public witnesses include the Climate March. And this year, the Global Day of Action will be on November 12th. So look in whatever city you're in. Or uh, we are also trying to organize um, candle vigil, so candles for COP on that weekend of November 11th to 13th. And maybe Shannon can put something in the chat or you can get a link and maybe your congregation or community group can promote the candles for COP vigil during uh, COP on that weekend, November 11th to 13th. So my ob observations, and I actually forgot to write down what time I started, was that while these events are for elites, there is a lot of other stuff that happens during COP and it becomes a real chance to, oops, sorry, to try to communicate while the media attention, to try to communicate to, to lots of people about what is going on and why this is a climate crisis, climate emergency, and why justice needs to be done. I also observe that there's a real difference between the attitudes and perspectives and the ways of acting and the priorities of, of activists lobbyists and institutional authorities, even with the World Council of Churches or the ACT Alliance. So I uh, spent some time with the uh, Orthodox Bishop of Zimbabwe, really different perspective from the lobbyist who was with Bread for the World Germany or the activists who were with some of the other church groups. The predominant focus and framings I also found very interesting. There's a picture of the then head of the UNFCCC, Christiana Figueres, receiving an interfaith petition for climate justice with, that's a lot of signatures, folks. That was at COP21 in Paris. So the predominant focus and framings by religious groups, church groups especially, was on equity. People said things like, we are guided by an equity lens. We are guided by science and equity. And from interviews that I did, um, many of the church-based activists who've been around for a long time, even those with Climate Action Network Canada, said, you know what, we were talking about equity and justice long before the environmental organizations were. And back in 2010, when I did a mini research project looking at climate justice and environmental justice in Canada, the only place I could find any language around climate justice was actually on a Kairos document. 
which is another reason for me to be excited to work for this organization. Um, but that was also looking at like what do religious groups contribute? Is there a specific faith or language and practices and stuff like that? And I was really surprised that it showed up surprisingly infrequently. In fact, technical expertise predominated. Um, expertise, whether it's policy or science or technical sort of stuff, was expressed in meetings, but faith stuff was expressed elsewhere. So people would talk privately and where I'd ask them questions about why, why were they doing this work and and why did they keep on with it you know, for a couple of decades? And they'd always talk about how important their faith was, but that wasn't brought out in public, which I think is really something. If we're going to talk about a public witness, we we also should talk about what why we do things. And, and it might also relate to our theories of social change. So what is your theory of social change? Is it just about advocating to politicians? Could it be advocating to church leaders? Is it, what's the role of spirituality? Is there a place for for the creator, for God, in the work that we try to do for climate justice. And if you Google that title and you Google my name, you'll find that I just wrote a column for Canadian Mennonite Magazine on uh, with that as the title. Then you can see what I have to say about it or not. Anyway, just to try to wrap up here, my, some of my conclusions are that we really need climate and creation care education in religious education at all levels, especially with leaders. We also need leaders to lead, not just the younger generation trying to say things, but those who've been around a while and those who have kind of positions of authority who are listened to. We need pastors to talk about climate change and justice from the pulpit. We need denominational leaders to say this is important. And it permeates all the work that we do, whether it's on migrant justice, human rights, refugees, international development work, solidarity with the church around the world and things like that. Lastly, I do want to say that faith groups do see the world differently. For one thing, they bring this, this idea in their faith-based ecological understandings that all humans belong to a, a shared morality. That is, all humans are worthy of ethical consideration. We say everybody is our neighbor. But more than that, we, we have a more cosmological sense of things too. That changes to all of creation, all creatures are worthy of ethical consideration. All creation matters. So this politics of creation, care, justice, and a creator is not just the technicist policy language and tools that tends to permeate uh, whenever we're thinking and talking about climate policy, climate action, and so forth. And I really want to emphasize that that is a very unique contribution of faith groups. So I want to close with this quote from Pope Francis in Laudato Si. If you have not read that and you are a Christian, you should read it. It's the most important Christian document ever written about the environment um, and about justice. And it's not just about the environment because it also brings in indigenous rights, respect for cultures and things like that. Lots of other stuff, a critique of technicism or technological managerialism. Um, Pope Francis wrote it in one, at one point towards the end, a strategy for real change calls for rethinking processes in their entirety. For it is not enough to include a few superficial ecological considerations while failing to question the logic which underlies present day culture. So thank you for listening to me and um, that. And if you have any questions, feel free to search for my name on the Kairos website and shoot me an email and I'll definitely respond to you. I can also send you these slides if you're interested and I'll answer questions when it's the appropriate time tonight. Thank you very much, Randy. And uh, I'm glad that you're going to be representing us at uh, COP27 this year. Well, actually I won't be there because Kairos and For the Love of Creation is sending a delegation of youth, indigenous peoples from Turtle Island, and um, Kairos partners from the Global South, because the point is to get voices that have not been listened to. They, they've been ignored, they've been muted. Um, try to get them a voice in this really oh. important platform. Oh, well, that's great. Well, I'm staying home, but I'm hoping that uh, Yusra and all the rest will uh, have really important things to say that I can keep sending yeah, out to I'm all sure. the rest of the Canadians. 
Okay, so we have a, a short amount of time now for any questions you might have. I hope that you've been looking in the chat um, in the chat to see uh, what has been happening there. There's one person who asked whether the video was available on YouTube, and it is. I don't have the link handy, uh, but I can send it out to everyone. Uh, the other means, of course, is just to go on YouTube and to uh, do a, um, a Google search for it. Oh, Randy just put it on. Thank you, Randy. Um, Shannon has also put a couple of links on, one for candles for COP27 and also uh, one about environmental racism. So please uh, put up your electronic hand uh, if you have a question or comment for any one of the speakers, for Vicki, for Elizabeth and John, or for Randy. Um, we've got uh, 10 minutes or so to, uh, to take those uh, questions if, uh, if you would, uh, if you have any comments to make. Henriette asked, how is Kairos responding to concerns about COP27, the Egypt's restrictions on the rights of civil society? Um, that's, that's a really important question. And uh, I would say that um, that should have been a much more important thing for all of the civil society, climate action network, environmental organizations and, and nations like Canada to be emphasizing. Um, you know what? Yusra is actually from Kuwait and it, she might have some really interesting perspectives. She's going to wrap us up tonight. So, uh, you know, I'm going to throw that over to her as a wild pitch and uh, see if she can feel that at some point. Um, we have brought it up. You know, our delegates are many from the global South, so they're very aware of the, the social justice and human rights concerns. And we're hoping that some of that will get communicated. That's great. Thank you, Randy. Any questions from anyone? Yes, uh, Jetta. Uh, it's Utah. <laughs> oh, Utah, sorry. That's okay. um, I'm curious uh, how Kairos views the war in Ukraine and how um, that impacts a lot of uh, matters. <laughs> I guess that question is, is for Randy. Or Shannon. Or um, Shannon. So I would, say, I would call climate change a peace issue. I would call the war in Ukraine a, um, a petro war because energy has become one of the tools of the war. Uh, but that, that also goes to show how resource dependencies uh, make us more vulnerable or make certain places more vulnerable. Um, Kairos doesn't have a stand on the war in Ukraine at all, uh, but we do partner with other organizations. Um, you know, I'm personally involved with Development and Peace, the Mennonite Central Committee and others who, who are trying to, like it's really hard to, to tell a country that's been invaded what to do and how to do anything when you got one army attacking you. So, um, but it really points out the real significant need to uh, be extremely careful about how uh, resources lead us into um, positions where we're vulnerable. Thank you, Randy. There's a question from uh, Susan and Joe. No, it actually is a comment, to Elaine, uh, in regard to Ukraine and so the, uh, a lot of the ecological issues are, are apparent, but I don't know if you are aware of certain things that have been in the news, such as uh, 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 there's a lot of dolphins in the Black Sea, apparently like thousands of dolphins, and there's been thousands of dolphins have um, died as a result of the war because of um, dolphins uh, find their food and navigate with uh, sonar systems. And uh, the, these have been disrupted by 
the firing of missiles and that sort of thing. And there have been thousands of dolphins have died as a result. And that's just that's just one unseen um, uh, ecological disaster emanating from you know an unspeakable war. That but I just thought I'd point that out because when I I learned that fact, it I found that like everything related to this senseless war, just incredibly shocking. So it's not just humans who are suffering is what I'm trying to say. Thanks, Joe. I think uh, Vicky made that point and uh, so, did, uh, so, so did Elizabeth and John uh, about the fact that it's all the creatures on the planet. Yes. Um, any other questions? If not, we will uh, we will um, introduce Yusra. I'll introduce Yusra to you. She is the Kairos uh, youth delegate. Uh, to COP27, and she has kindly agreed to, to uh, say a few words about her involvement with the event uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the trip that she'll be making to Egypt for COP27. Welcome, Yusra. Hi, everybody. As much as I would like to talk about everything we have discussed today, that is impossible and we'd need a couple of days at least to even scratch the surface. Um, as such, I think I'll just give my very brief commentary on the most salient things that stood out to me in today's event. Vicky started us off with a discussion of indoctrination and the many systems around us that are of detriment to many others and touched particularly on ideas of disconnection. I share a lot of Vicky's sentiments about disconnection here. Disconnection breeds contempt. It breeds the idea of the other and only caring about oneself. These points reminded me of how I came across the idea of nimbyism in one of my classes or not in my backyardism. Um, so as Vicky mentioned, we do not always see the ramifications and that is what this phenomenon highlights. So what do we do about nimbyism as this class had us write a 250 word discussion post about? Honestly, I only need 10 words to say that we take the initiative to put it in our backyard. We put in the work. We become, we become more resolute to ensure we are actively looking for and participating in positive and collaborative discourse. Changing worldviews is something that comes up time and time again for me and has come up time and time again during the course of this webinar. I've been a part of many conversations about this and have written many essays as a college student about this. So in my role as a COP27 youth delegate, it's great to finally actively be a part of these changing worldviews, to be able to contribute as positively as I can. The Influenza video outlining the disease of burning and fossil fuels was great. Um, just to illustrate some of the more salient points this video makes, the cascading effects that were mentioned in this video that was filmed last year have been something we have seen with our own eyes in this time frame alone. From the floods in Pakistan, to the hurricanes in the Caribbean, to drought in Europe. However, let's move on to something slightly more positive. The idea of being encouraged about the opportunities the sphere of climate action presents is something Elizabeth brought up. In terms of COP and COP27, in conversations with a lot of the faculty at my university, um, we have said that still having these conference of the parties is a positive thing in itself. And it's when we stop having these that we are really in a dismal situation. When it comes to the transformative actions, as were mentioned by this video, I think it's equally important to take a moment to discuss some climate wins that are a result of these. 
According to Carbon Trust News, a United Nations report described the African continent's vast clean energy potential and described how it could blunt the harshest effects of global warming. Imagine the jobs this can create. Imagine the livelihoods that this can improve. Furthermore, communities in Mexico, Mexico's Oaxaca state have spent the last two decades transforming barren land into a forest. And they've managed to do this with minimum government intervention. They are an example to the rest of the world. As such, it might be worthwhile to mention here that this goes to show that communities should not be equated to the actions or inactions of their governments. They should never be punished for the actions or inactions of their governments. These communities have voices too that always deserve to be heard. The video also touched upon themes of colonialism and how that has caused social and ecological disasters. Now, what I'm going to say next is something I mention and bring up quite often because part of me is honestly still in disbelief. The IPCC has named colonialism as one of the driving factors of the climate crisis. And this is thanks to the advocacy of indigenous groups. I'm very hurt to hear this. And what they will actually do about this remains to be seen, of course. But I have hope that, th that there will be change. I have to have hope. And I will take as much action as I can by framing these issues of intersectionality and colonialism at the very heart of my COP27 messaging. Those will be my ripples, or at, least, or at the very least, the start of the ripples I hope to make. Again, the video talked about how this is not just a science issue. It's a spiritual one. Vicky again mentioned the idea of bridging communities through faith, something our delegation can play a big role in. From the start, I have always wanted my COP27 messaging to be around the fact that we are indeed not the lords or masters. We are stewards of Mother Earth, and we are stewards that can learn from the non-species around us, the non-human species around us. As Randy outlined, there's a lot faith-based communities have done and are doing, especially with regards to international development work. The amount of community building and alliance building and learning that this leads to is truly incredible. And I resonate with the idea of working together, having conversations and to hope and heal together. That is going to be very central to my message and should come as no surprise. We are all faith-based communities after all. I'd like to conclude with the reiteration of the sentiment that creation masters, everyone and everything human and non-human are worthy of ethical considerations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yusra. It's a beautiful message, and I'm sure everybody here uh, joins with me in, in wishing you the best of luck on this uh, trip to COP27. So I'd like to thank the presenters, and I'd like, like to thank also you, our guests that are here today. I think uh, the fact that you're here um, speaks volumes about how important uh, climate concerns are to, to all of us. And I hope that you get to uh, follow some COP27 news in early November when it starts. Uh, thank you again and good night.